you're creating wealth within the company that will give you that freedom of time in order to focus on what you really enjoy. Episode 111. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I am speaking with Chartered Financial Planner, Katie Nutting, who specialises in helping individuals to build up their wealth in the early stages and to help them achieve their goals in retirement. Now, this is the first Chartered Financial Planner that we've had on Business of Architecture UK and I thought it was an important conversation to have and kind of continues the theme around money and finance that we've kind of been starting over the last few weeks here on the show and um, Katie gives a very good overview of all the different specialties that she works with what a financial planner does why it's important to have awareness and to plan for the future uh, and to think about your finances she often herself specializes in things like divorce planning pension planning investments taxation financial planning, savings and protection. And Katie's own personal story is very moving about how she herself learnt about the power of money uh, through something that happened in her, her childhood and how she saw the effects of money on other people. And it kind of begins to continue the insights that we've been exploring here as well on the show about this kind of the relationship that we have to finance and to money and how that can really kind of begin to shape our financial futures. So sit back, relax, and here is Katie Nutting. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself. We can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of. And I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020. So there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next, what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Katie, Hello. Welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to have you here. We are sitting in this, one of my favourite spots for doing podcasts, overlooking the Thames. Um, and it's, yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me and for inviting me. This is my podcast debut as well. Excellent. So there Excellent. There we go. Good. Could be a good thing or a bad thing, we'll oh, see. Well, I'm <laughs> sure you're going you're gonna to cruise through it. <laughs> so you're a financial planner. Yes. And I think this is a conversation that... W- is so important to anybody running their business. Um, it's so important to any professional. So important yep. to like just general humanity yep. of like what to do with your money, how to manage it, how to make it grow, how to look after it. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how you got into financial planning. Okay. And, and perhaps we can talk about some of the sort of myths people have around financial planning and sort yeah, of mis- sure. and mistakes. And it's not just something reserved for the ultra high net worth of the world but it's actually something that's incredibly important for for everybody yeah that's really really true so let's start there how did you become a financial planner or what is financial planning and perhaps the two can sort of okay um i don't always like the word financial planner or financial advisor okay and i think the reason being because when when somebody expects to see a financial planner i'm not what they think of it's definitely a term that i think 
in your mind you think of a middle-aged man. Right. So I think it's quite a stuffy term and it can put people off a little bit. So um, when I do give the, the full title and say, you know, I'm a financial planner, I always kind of caveat it a bit and say, you know, I see my role as being the person that helps you answer those big life questions. Right. And it really differs from person to person, but it's, it's not to do with figures. It's all to do with, can I afford to buy my first property? Um, can we afford to have children? I want to work part-time or do a career change or start my own business. So it, it's answering those big life questions for people. Right, okay, so it's not just sort of maintaining vast sums of wealth. But it's actually those kind of pivotal points in making a decision. Most definitely. Yeah, it's all about life stages. And for the years that I've done this, I mean, I've done this for 10 years now, so I've seen people through the majority of those life stages that we all go through. So people's... Um, people's attitudes change over time people's objectives change over time so I see it as more of planning for your future and answering the question about whether those dreams and aspirations are actually achievable for you rather than it being facts and figures yeah and it's quite it's quite interesting you we were saying earlier about the, the emotional relationship that so many people yeah. have to money yeah and that we often live in a culture where we don't talk about our finances and no. our plan and our planning. So, so what is it that you do to to help help with clients? And perhaps we can actually get a little bit of your background because your your story of how you became a financial planner is is I think kind of illustrates this yeah. point very well. Yeah, definitely. Um, so taking you back, um, so my mom and dad were married. They got two small children. My dad ran his own decorating business. Um, he'd been really successful. They'd just bought a brand new house. Um, my mom didn't work because 30 odd years ago, the norm was that you were a kept woman. So she didn't work. She looked after two children. Um, and unexpectedly at 31, my dad passed away. So it was completely unexpected. He ran a very successful business with a business partner. And overnight, my life and my mom's life, my sister's life, our whole family's life just changed. Um, so I was exposed to the power of money quite early on mm. in that respect. Um, we weren't sheltered from it. We knew that something big had happened and that things were going to change. Um, because that's the reality. When you've got two children to look after, it's very difficult to try and wrap them in bubble wrap and, mm. ex, you know, pretend that nothing's changed. Um, so at that time, my mom had got a big mortgage. My dad had no life cover at all right. because I don't think it was as talked about back then. And it was very unexpected at such a young age. Yeah. But also he had nothing in place with his business partner to say that actually if something did happen to either of them, what would the business be, be valued at and who would then receive compensation for the share of his business. Right. So because there was nothing in place, my mum walked away from that business with barely anything because she couldn't run a decorating business with two small children. It wasn't what she, she knew, what she was good at. So she came away with absolutely nothing except a big mortgage to pay for and a family to look after all on her own now. So our lives changed because she went from being the person that was at home every day mm. to having three jobs. So it was, yeah, it was a big, big change for everybody. Right. So she she ended up kind of inheriting the the asset of the business itself, but without the kind of know how to run it or exactly. And she wasn't able to take a salary from it or anything. No, right. she she wouldn't have known what to do. And especially at the time when you're grieving, you can't, you don't really want to be focusing on on the logical side it's so emotional so her only option was to give the business up and um, his business partner obviously wasn't as good a friend as what they'd thought he was because he was quite happy for her to walk away with nothing and for him to take over the whole business so yeah it was a it was a big change and she started working three jobs so she would deliver corporate papers to offices in the morning which we'd go with her then she'd work in an accounts department while we were at school and then in the evening she used to debt collect which um, she wasn't. She wasn't a bailiff. She wasn't one of the heavies that got sent round to you know to clear people's houses out. It was very different to I think what people think. But basically, she would go to people's houses and she would collect one pound, two pound a week from them because they were renting a colour TV or um, a washing machine, and a lot of it was elderly elderly people that didn't want to invest in white goods. And that was fine when we went to their house because, you know, we'd, we'd go with her, we'd go in, we'd get a cup of tea. It was all very nice and friendly. But there were also people that she would have to collect on that 
were not nice people and we were told to stay in the car. She'd lock the doors and we used to watch her. Oh, yeah, we had to go with her, yeah, because there was nobody else to look after us. So we'd go with her and we would watch her knock on these people's doors and we'd watch people peep through the curtains, see my mum and all of a sudden pretend that they weren't there. And I think that we knew from that point that the person that had the money was in a position of power and you never wanted someone like my mom knocking on your door for debts that you couldn't pay. So we knew very, very early on about how important it was to understand what money was all about and deal with it in the right way. What were the sort of things that you learned from that as a, as a child or, you know, that... I think that it, it was about responsibility. I think that was the biggest learning curve. You know, my mum always made it very clear to us that you didn't get into unnecessary debt unless it was asset backed. You know, she knew she had a mortgage. We knew that. But we knew that we'd got an asset for that mortgage. It wasn't like we were taking out loans to pay for, you know, expensive holidays or anything like that. Because we didn't do anything like that. We just, it was for the bare basics really and she taught us about taking responsibility for yourself and independence really not relying on somebody else to pick up after you and look after you oh she's formidable I know I've told you a few other stories which I won't add to the podcast but she is yeah she's a force to be reckoned with so yeah I'm very lucky and so when did you become involved with financial planning and how would you and I know that you've spoken about it before in in terms of I haven't thought about it like it's very much a relationship-based thing yeah. or, or activity. Um, and say, for example, something like what your mum went through yeah. with not having anything in place in terms of losing her husband or losing her husband passed away. Um, what is, is that a common situation that, that businesses or business owners don't have any kind of protection mechanisms in place? Yeah. It's really common. A lot of businesses that I go to don't have anything in place. And, and this is, ranges from, you know, service industry um, through to other types of businesses where they're producing goods. So it's quite common for people not to consider that. And I think it's twofold, really. I think um, usually people that are younger don't expect anything to happen to them because everybody thinks that they're invincible earlier on. It's only your mortality only comes into perspective later on in life I think so yeah. um, if it's a younger person that's running a business you don't think about it as much I also think it, it is an uncomfortable conversation to have because if you're in business with a friend especially do you really want to bring up the fact that actually if something happens to one of us do I know that you'll look after my family and and do we know what we would do in that kind of situation and it, it can be uncomfortable but it's a more uncomfortable conversation if you are put in the position where it does happen and both sides, you know, the family and the remaining shareholders need to make sure that they're getting what what they should be getting. And people would, you'd prefer to set that up when everybody's friends and everybody's, you know, in a good space and everybody's fit and healthy than have to think about it at a later date. But it is very common that people don't put it in place. What, what are the other sorts of things that people neglect with their financial planning? And when is the, sort of the best time to start financial planning? I think financial planning can be used for everybody. And obviously there's differing degrees and there's things that I do that are different to what you can do at home. But I think having a budget is really important. And that's for your personal life and for your business it's about knowing what comes in every month what goes out every month what your assets are what your liabilities are put it in a spreadsheet it's just knowing what your current position is and I think too many people don't know that and it causes a lot of anxiety for people because you're out of control if you don't know where you stand yeah and there's a lot of as you were saying earlier there's a lot of kind of the, the, the secrecy that goes around yeah. people's finances yeah do you ever find that people are find it difficult to talk to you about yes about what's happening in their finances and and why that might be yeah and I think um the worst situation I ever had is I, I'd gone to do a corporate day so I'd gone to an office um they put me in a room for the day and I do like a GP surgery so people book for 30 minutes of time just to get some free financial advice yep. uh, and it can't be advice because we're not engaging with the client but it's a bit of guidance for them uh, and had a guy come in and um, he said he wanted to be more tax efficient. That was his objective. 
And I said, well, can you tell me how much you earn? And he said, that's a very personal question. I'd rather not answer. Mm. And I, I basically shut the conversation down because if, if he can't talk to me openly about what his current position is, I can't help him. It's yeah. like going to the doctor and saying, I've got a problem, but I don't want to tell you where it is or, or what's happening. You know, you've, you've got to approach it very open-minded and I think that that only comes when you start to build a relationship with the financial planner because you need to know that they understand you, that you trust them. And there are lots of things, lots of questions that clients could ask mm. in order to build that rapport. And what kind of questions could a client ask? I think it's quite important to ask about qualifications, which right. we don't do. I don't think. It's not often that people ask me about my qualifications, which is disappointing because I spent years <laughs> studying, <laughs> you know. So I want people to ask me, you know, I want them to know that I'm chartered because it means that I've covered all the different areas of financial planning and I've passed those exams and I do ongoing CPD to keep that, to maintain that okay. qualification. So it's, like it's, it's quite a regulated industry. It's yeah, so. very, very much so. So I think that's always a big one. I think that personal connections are really important in what I do and that goes from both sides I think that getting to know a little bit more about the person that you're working with so asking their background you know how long have you done this for what type of clients do you tend to advise because mm. you probably want to work with somebody that also works with people in the same position as you yeah so that they know the kind of questions to ask and the things to flag up further down the line and it you were saying that you've got quite a, a, a diverse portfolio of clients. So yep. some, sometimes you work with very um, wealthy clientele. Sometimes it's a kind of very different mix. Yep. And, and you were saying, obviously, these kind of important life decisions is always worth consulting a financial planner. What, are the, what sorts of decisions? You were saying buying a house. Yeah, yeah. That's usually the earlier one. Right. So, you know, the first stage, it's about, well... I've put this money to one side, I want to buy a property, but I don't want to buy it for X amount of years. So what should I do with the money? That's quite a common question. Right. So when you're just starting out, I think later down the line it comes to, should I be overpaying my mortgage or should I be saving into a different account? Yep. That's quite a common question. Um, and at the moment we're in a very, very low interest rate arena yeah. um so lots of people are considering that conundrum um next can be pension planning where people are, are in a job where they're getting a pension paid to them for um for the work that they're doing from their employer so it's about should i join my pension scheme because a lot of the time people don't think about pensions seriously probably until they're in 30s 40s 50s and beyond um i'd say also within that stage of life is probably when you start having children or you've got other liabilities. So protection comes into it quite a lot. So how do I protect my family? How do I protect my income? You know, what should I be putting in place to make sure that if something happens to me, that everybody around me is, is okay and can carry on? So that's probably a middle stage. And then mm. later down the line, it's planning for retirement or getting to the point where you're actually in retirement and you're turning the assets that we've accumulated into an income. Well, this is interesting. Um, the idea of thinking about retirement and pensions and it's come up it's come out a few times now with people i've been speaking to mm -hmm. in terms of uh prospective clients or with architects um what happens you know sometimes in a business like it's just kind of this life cycle of ups and downs and yeah. there's never been any forethought and then retirement is happening and there hasn't been any kind of there isn't much assets yeah. or, or, or anything put away yeah yeah when is the right time to be thinking about that? Because I think there's a, a bit of a, a kind of myth that you've got to be somewhere financially stable first before, you know, talking about a financial planner or, or even the kind of, well, I haven't got any finances, so I'm not going to... Yep. I'm not going to, you know, that, surely that's reserved for the people who have got large assets and yeah, things like yeah. that. Yeah, And I think that's quite a common misconception. Mm. I'd say, particularly when I'm working with business owners, um, but if we look at uh, people that are employed to start with, when you've got, nowadays, uh, if you work for an employer, you have to have a pension scheme set yeah. up because of the new auto-enrolment rules. So there is a pension scheme there that your employer will pay into if if you're willing to pay into it as well in most right. cases so even if you don't have assets to think about as part of your financial plan you should be maximizing what your employer will give you 
So if they're willing to pay 5% into a pension, if you pay 5%, it's worthwhile looking at sacrificing that 5% from your salary into the pension because you're getting something for nothing. Right. So I think that that's one area where even if people don't have a, um, a lot of money, it's definitely an area that they should be looking at to see whether it's affordable for them and are they getting the most from their employer. Right. On the flip side, when you run a business, a pension is really, really tax efficient for you to set up because you can pay into it from from the business account. Oh, and it could be an expense. Exactly. Oh. There we go. See, everybody <laughs> is prick up a little bit then. <laughs> but it's, it's a really, really good way of managing that side of the business because you can pay a gross amount into a pension from a company account on behalf of your own pension scheme. So it's an extra benefit that you can pay yourself, but it comes out gross. So it's a really good element to think of. Right, okay. And is that something that becomes like a personal ownership of the pension or is it yep. owned by the business still? No, it's a personal asset. Right. And do you give advice then on what people can do in terms of like perhaps accelerating the growth of their savings? Yeah. yeah. And I mean, the easiest piece of advice to give people is to start as early as possible. Right. You know, that's what you'd say to most people. But that's the same for any kind of saving, because we know that over a period of time, the cumulative way that money grows, it, it's better for you to start early. And the longer you leave it, the less likely you are to build up as much money. So it's great to start early. But you also have to then um, look at that compared to what you're actually trying to achieve. Mm. Because pensions are great from a tax point of view. But actually, if you're 25 and you want to save for something for when you're 35, a pension's not appropriate because you can't take it out for a much later period. Right. So it's that trade-off between, you know, I can do the facts and figures and say this is the most tax-efficient thing for you to do but if it doesn't fit in with your objectives and the goals that you're trying to achieve then it, it's not the right thing for you. So how does your your role intersect with other consultants such as accountants and mortgage brokers yeah. and life insurance? It's quite a lot of people think that I am an accountant. I think there's, that's quite a common misconception again. And yep. I think accountants are financial planners. Um, I work with a lot of accountants because they get to the point where they're planning with a business and they can, show, they can forecast cash flow for them, but they don't actually know how that interacts with other areas of their personal life. Right. So it's things such as pension planning, so extracting money from a business to pay into a pension. An accountant can't advise on that because they're not qualified to. Right. So typically an accountant will then refer to me. Right, so that's the kind of the, the, the line and it doesn't... Exactly, yeah. And also, I suppose, as a business owner, um, you're making lots of... Like an accountant is often kind of... They're very aware of the ins and outs of what's happening in your yep. business and not necessarily... They're protecting. It's a kind of protective stance in yeah, many ways. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to like um, the entrepreneurial mind that might be a bit more aggressive or you're taking risks or you want to take investments. And yeah, yeah. Um, so what... From a kind of basic savings point of view, what kind of things would, is a sensible strategy for somebody who's running their own business to begin? I'd say to start with, always having some liquidity available. Right. So whenever we work with clients, we always look at how much they should have in a cash reserve so that if anything happens, they know that they can cover their essential costs for a period of time. And I don't think that's any different for a business because you will have fixed costs in a business that you run and you need to make sure that you've got enough to cover those fixed costs yep. if something happens and the work isn't coming in. So having some money that's accessible, so liquid assets that you can tap into to cover those costs mm. for a period of time, which for some people they're comfortable with three months, others it's six, others it's 12. It depends on what you're comfortable with and what your forecast is going forward, but having some cash available to cover the fixed costs so that you're not in a position where you have to make drastic decisions is really important. And what are the sorts of things that you deal with in terms of, uh, say if you do have a lot of assets, you do have a lot of liquidity and, and cash, what are the sorts of protective measures that you work with clients to maintain their wealth or to cultivate it in terms of you know, either investment strategies or even things like prenups and divorce yeah yeah so it can be one of the biggest it's huge another one for businesses as well is um lasting powers of attorneys what's that so having um an lpa in place so that actually if you lose capacity right while you're running your business who actually can then make decisions on your behalf 
Right. Okay. Lots of businesses don't have a lasting power of attorney in place. And it's very different to a personal lasting power of attorney where someone makes decisions about your finances or your health. Mm. So I work with a lot of um, solicitors that, who, that do private client work and encourage businesses to take out lasting powers of attorney so right. that if they do lose capacity, that you, you give your other business partners authority to make those decisions on your behalf. Yeah, It might be for a short term, it might be for the long term. But I do a lot of work there. Um, yeah, prenups is um, a difficult one. And I do a lot of divorce work, sadly, um, which I think brings prenups more into focus with people that have gone through it themselves. But if you've grown a business, if you've worked really, really hard to put those foundations in place, you want to make sure that if anything does happen further down the line, if you get married um, and things don't work out, it's really important to protect yourself and, and to protect the business as a whole because what you don't want to happen is that you have to, you know, liquidate the business or you have to do something else to raise, raise finances to pay off an ex-partner because you haven't looked at what you should be putting in place before the event actually happens. Yeah. So I work with a lot of solicitors on that as well. And what are the sort of, and this is uh, quite interesting and personal um, with divorces like mm. I know a lot of friends and family who have been through divorces yeah. maybe it's that kind of age in life yeah, where, yeah, yeah. where it's been happening and it has been one of the most sort of you know on one sense there's a lot of freedom and a new lease of life yeah. but also financially this can be one of the single most um, difficult yeah. events that happens somebody's you know like vast assets can get can get split Exactly. You, you all of a sudden you have 50% of the assets, say, and if you're both running a home, you can still have 70% of the expenditure. So divorce planning is really difficult, uh, especially if you've got a couple where one person looks after the finances and one person doesn't, mm. which we tend to have, you know, in any relationship, people have their strengths and weaknesses. So there are certain things that I do at home um, because they're my strengths and there are certain things that my husband does at home because that's his strength. So you always split those jobs. Mm. Um, but if the finances aren't your area... When that happens, it's a massive shock to think that you've then got to take over paying the bills and understanding money coming in and money going out again. So those are some of the most vulnerable clients that I work with. It's some of the most enjoyable because yeah. I see people grow and I see people become confident with money and, and take more control over it. Um, but again, that just starts from the basics, doing your budget, looking at your incomings, your outgoings, um, also making sure you know what is available. Yeah. So old pension plans from 20 years ago or um, assets that you may well have forgotten about. Mm. So it's about bringing it all in together, looking at what their snapshot is of their current position and helping them put a plan in place to get to where they want to be further down the line. And in terms of, say, you know, you've, you've collated a, um, a large amount of assets or you're starting to become quite wealthy or your business is starting to do really, to do really well, what are the sort of general overarching strategies that you assist with clients in terms of protecting their long-term wealth like yeah. outside of prenups and those types of things but actually things that can start to grow um your your capital if you like yeah pensions is a big one like say going back to that because of how tax efficient it is right. so making sure that you're bringing enough money out of the business into your pension over the time that you're running that business because you get an allowance every year that you can put into a pension and, and it's important to try and utilize that when you can because obviously you'll end up with a bigger pot so explain, in retirement. explain to me how how a pension works where is the money going to how is it growing is it off is it kept into kind of government bonds or what, what can you put your pension into all sorts of different types of assets it or can, can go into lots of different assets so if we look at a very um, standard pension you'll open a pension account you can then choose whether you put some of it in cash fixed interest property or equities right so you can choose investment funds within the pension there are other things that pensions can buy if we get a little bit more complicated you can buy individual shares in a business um, you can also buy commercial property which for the type of work that you do and the clients yeah. that you work with can be really appealing if you're looking at using your pension to buy a studio or um, you know, an office space, something like that. So yes. it can be as simplistic and as complicated as what you need it to be. Right, no, I've heard lots of 
architectural. I've heard a lot of property developers have spent their pensions on like, shops and properties yeah. that you can use it for commercial, yeah, commercial yeah. purposes. And it's, uh, it's a very sort of different way of investing exactly rather than using perhaps the sort of standard like index funds or or ISA accounts or yep. those types of things yeah so pensions is one of the bigger ones and that really helps with an exit plan further down the line which I find a lot of people don't always consider until a bit later on so if you're running a business you should have an exit plan in mind even if it's a very loose exit plan in 30 years time because then you've got something that you're working towards um, so having an exit plan is really important and it also means that you can step back at the time that you want to and that you're not held anywhere for financial reasons. It's really difficult seeing somebody run a business or be employed because they have to financially. Yes. Your approach to the work that you do is so different if you're doing it for that reason and you're not doing it because you enjoy it and because you love it. Yeah. So if you get an extra strategy in place and you know that you've done the steps throughout your time that you've run that business, you can exit in a way that's really pleasant, really smooth, because you're going at the right time, in the right way, with the right amount of money, in a very tax efficient manner. So what's, oh, that's interesting, because what's a bad exit plan versus a good exit plan? And this is like you say, I think a lot of architects don't necessarily consider this and many architects, either they love what they're doing and they don't want to yep. kind of practice and forever and then there's some sort of some kind of succession planning that happens or doesn't happen yeah. for that matter um, but what is an exit strategy and what's what's the difference between a good one and a bad one I think knowing what you want to happen to the business so it could be that you want it to pass to family members um, but do they want it that's one big thing you know some people have an idea that they'll <laughs> pass down a business farming's really big on this yeah so if if you I work with a couple of clients that are farmers and ideally they want their children to take on that farming role but farming's not very glamorous today <laughs> you know you don't you don't go on Instagram and, and see these women in wellies and you know aspire to be like that so that that's quite a struggle so yeah. it's knowing who you want to run that business how you want it to be structured whether you've got something that's saleable because that's really important as well. You know, are you going to s uh, sell the business that you've set up? Will it be a way that you bring people through the business to take over and you'll exit with some form of goodwill because of the relationships that you've brought up? So I think it's knowing what you want to happen to the business. That's one element. And I think that if you do that properly, that's a good exit plan. Doing it rushed is probably the worst situation. So getting to the point where you say, I've had enough, that's it. Or if you've got to step back because of illness, if you haven't ever thought about what you want to happen, all of a sudden you have to face some really big decisions yeah. in, a, in a very crucial part of your life where you might not be in the right mindset to make those decisions. So I think you know making sure that you've got enough time to do that is really, really key. So a lot of people, you know, they've spent their entire life running a business and you know, again with architects this is a kind of it's it's I think one of the sort of difficulties is this kind of reluctance to talk about money yeah and we all have this very deep emotional relationship with money about what it means about us you know how much I earn is somehow a reflection on on me yeah yeah or, or we have the opposite where like I don't care about money or you know in certain creative circles there is the the kind of impoverished starving artist ideology yeah where, you know it's not important I'm here to to create and not do how how do you kind of begin to open that up as a conversation with people I think that when um when some people, if I say think about a conversation about money, mm. lots of people will, will have this image of two business people in suits, in a high-rise building, you know, very dark and gloomy day, and it's a very intense conversation. Whereas actually the conversations that I have with people about money are completely different. That's not what it's about. It is not this, it shouldn't be this intense subject which has got a lot of negativity and coldness around. Because actually, it's not about that figure that's on the balance sheet at the end of the day. It's what that money does for you. Yes. So really, the conversations I'm having with clients, it isn't just going straight in and um, looking at how much money they've got and them telling me that they want to achieve a certain figure. That's never the initial conversation. I want to know what their objective is. Mm. You know, what are the things that concern you? What are the things that you think about that keep you up at night? And how does that feed into 
what we're trying to achieve. So people always have an emotional relationship with money, not the actual figure, but what it allows them to do. Yeah. And what we're trying to do for that client is say to them, okay, your dream is that you want to quit your job and open a bakery. So that's a conversation about money, but it doesn't have to be. The conversation is, okay, let's have a look at, if we are going to go down that route, what do we need to put in place to get you to that point? How long is it going to take? What sacrifices do you need to make now in order to get there? And, and that's not somebody saying, I want to make lots and lots of money and I want to be really greedy. It's somebody saying, I've got a vision that I want to get to. Yeah. And you, you do need money in order to make certain things happen. But it doesn't have to be your driver. And for a lot of people, that's not their driver. And like you said, in the creative industry, even more so, it's not what your driver is. Yeah. You're trying to create something beautiful for somebody else. But that... By creating wealth in your business, that actually enables you to do that even more. It might enable you to bring somebody on as an assistant, which you could be then giving them that open door into the career that they've always wanted that nobody else has given them a chance in. So you could be you know, building somebody else's dream. And it also might allow you then to do the work that you're more passionate about in your business because you're creating wealth within the company that will give you that freedom of time in order to focus on what you really enjoy yeah i think that's a great place to to wrap up with that you know just seeing money as the great facilitator yep. of things and yep. you know this and just being aware of the relationship that we have to it yeah and kind of flushing that out and to start talking about it yeah definitely in, in, in all industries is yep. so so powerful and as we can see here what I've, what I've learned so much today it's not just something where it's a cold, dry subject where it's just for the uber wealthy. No, it's, no. This is real, it's real life. Like money affects all of us yep. all the time. Yeah. Brilliant. So if people want to get in contact with you or what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, definitely. So um, it can go through the website. So I'm with a firm called Ober to Wealth Management. Um, so they can find me there. I'm also on LinkedIn as well. So Katie Nutting on LinkedIn. And you've got a great Instagram handle and page as well which I highly recommend people go and have a look at. <laughs> yeah, the money mum. So that's the something money that mom, I, yes. <laughs> I set up personally. And it was, again, it was just to give, to break things down. So break down the barriers and um, give people a bit of a glossary about what financial terms mean and just give snip, snippets of, you know, what, what financial planning is and what people can do without having to pay out loads and loads of money or have loads of wealth to get started. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you for having me. Cheers. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.